Hey there, welcome back. Appreciate listening in. Today I am with Rafe Kelly, as you know, and in a couple of moments I'll have Rafe introduce himself, but one of the things that I'd like to highlight to frame it, um, I've known Rafe for a while, and I've known Rafe's work for a while, and one of the things that has just consistently impressed me, and you'll see, I think, is how goddamn smart Rafe is. And I learn a, a lot every time we talk, and so Rafe, I'm, I'm glad to have another opportunity to learn with you. Yeah. And I wonder if you could share maybe some of the salient points of what you think your career life narrative is thus far and help us set the stage for where we go from here. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me when people ask me what I do at this stage because uh, it's kind of grown. Um, I think the the very short version that I give people is I teach a combination of parkour, um, martial arts, other movement elements and wilderness skills um, and mindfulness and community aspects through retreats, which we offer three times a year, and an online academy. Um, and that's been something that has evolved over a long period of time. And there is kind of, it started as more of a primarily physically oriented practice and has evolved towards really being oriented towards questions of meaning in life and how we gain that and I've been deeply influenced by the work of Jordan Peterson. And then for the last three years, especially by the work of John Ravakey, who I've had the privilege of, um, of collaborating with and getting to communicate with a lot and having him come out to one of my retreats. So he's had a huge influence on me. So um, I would say that what Evolve Move Play is, is my own uh, humble offering in trying to answer the question of how we awaken from the meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. I love it. I get the sense quite often that we're wrestling with related questions. And in particular, I find that it's so difficult given the social and cultural context to articulate effectively how physical practice maps onto these things that people consider psychological, philosophical. It's just so indicative of the I think the broader pathology that we're experiencing mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. Um, right before we got on the call, we were talking about a book that we uh, that I'm just finishing that you read called uh, um, The Reenchantment of the Earth by Morris Berman. And he talks about the idea uh, that, you know, the Cartesian paradigm is fundamentally mistaken in important ways. And one of the really important ways is that it it cuts us off from the body. And, you know, John Rebecca talks about the two worlds mythology and how it gave us some really useful psychotechnology, um, but it created this potential problem, which is that we keep placing meaning in that other world, in the heavenly realm. Mm -hmm. And then if we, if we cease to believe in the heavenly realm, we just also lose all the meaning. <laughs> And the Cartesian worldview really doesn't help with that, right? It, it it kind of removes the self and agency and the body from the equation. It's like we live in a clockwork universe where we have these little souls that are poking through the clockwork from the outside. And we know that we exist and that we have them because we can think and reason, um, but they don't really, they don't actually line up with the causal system of the world in some weird way. Um, and that was his, his solution to a bunch of different difficult problems, but it set us up for a problem where we, we, we are sort of inherently unable to fully recognize the importance of the body and of lived experience and of the relationship with the earth as fundamental to the cultivation of wisdom or the cultivation of the self or what it is to live a virtuous life. And so you and I both, I think, are in the business of saying we have to wake up from that, that what we are seeking won't be found until we return to right relationship with the body, the body in relationship to the natural world and the body in relationship to other people. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things I think Berman explicates quite well is this distinction between fact and value. And we've gone all in on creating a world of fact, yeah. but 
that doesn't tell us how to live. It tells us maybe how things work, but Mm -hmm. it fundamentally can't answer the questions of, is this thing worth doing? I know how to do it and all the technical details, but is it worth it? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think Peterson's uh, articulation of that in the beginning of Maps of Meaning is as good as I've seen, right? Mm -hmm. We need to know, uh, I think, I can't, I'm hoping I can get this quote right, but at the end of that first like little introductory essay, he says, we need to know, um, uh, what the world is like, what to do about what the world is like, and that there's a difference between the two. Mm. Something, it's something like that, but, but the key distinction he's making is that there is, there is a world of objective facts. Um, and there is a world of values and we really live inside the world of values, right? That's what, like, we need to act and Mm -hmm. objective facts cannot actually guide us to action without reference to subjective experience. Um, Mm -hmm. so, and, and that arises from the body. Yeah. Yeah. So we are we are in this process of having to recover. Um, Peterson has this beautiful little essay and maps of meaning about the homunculus, right? And he talks about, you know, the this motor map that we have in our mind that, you know, contains a much bigger, much more neural representation of the tongue and the eyes and the hands. And I think Peterson talks a lot about the eye and the and the tongue, right? He talks a lot about being able to see correctly, being able to unblinkingly look at the truth and to speak the truth. And he touches a little bit on the hand, but I think that's what's missing. The hand is the representation of the body and of our capacity and the multi aptness of getting into interaction with the world. And to me, most of the uh You can call it, there's a variety of spaces that interact with these topics, but the IDW, the the intellectual dark web, the intellectual deep web, the sense-making space, um, you know, the metamodern community, uh, they're, they're really focused at the level of the propositional, even though they're realizing within the propositional that it's not sufficient, mm-hmm. <laughs> but they don't. I feel like you there's a consistent failure to fully recognize the primacy of the body and body-based practices. Mm-hmm. And I, I always feel like the conversation is sort of like pointing in that direction and that it's like something that people can't fully rock because for the most part, they just don't have the physical practices. So their mind can be pointing in that direction but if they don't have, if they haven't done years of martial arts and years of parkour and years of these things, it's like they're trying to describe an elephant that they've never seen, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like the sense making conversation goes if only we had access to this technology, this praxis yeah. that could somehow connect us with the body. It's like, yeah, it's been there for a little while, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's. You know, I think of my stuff and not like, I don't actually know that much about Chinese martial arts, um, but I feel like there's this weird way in which like all that we're doing is kind of gung fu, right? Gung fu just means good work, right? It's a, this idea that there is, um, there's something that arises within deeply intentional practice mm. and the traditional combative arts are one way of accessing the Kung Fu, right? But Kung Fu also um, had this broader philosophical application, right? We think Kung Fu is a specific way of learning to fight, but it's actually a a concept that is much broader. Mm -hmm. And I think that as movement culture has arisen, the natural movement movement, um, whatever it is, like if you go back, you'll find that there's little schools of Kung Fu that have little bits of these things, right? and and they and the traditional martial arts of china are interesting because well this is i i this is something that i actually think is typical of martial arts 
worldwide originally and has been lost, but they were tied to wisdom practices. Mm -hmm. Like people don't realize that internal martial arts, right? Tai Chi, Bagua, Jing Yi are, are Taoist specifically. They're Taoist martial arts, right? The Shaolin Temple, Shaolin Kung Fu, is Buddhist, right? If you go over to Japan, um, uh, sumo wrestling, right? Maybe the oldest kind of martial art that's been practiced in a very consistent way that we know of. It's it's actually a martial art of Shinto temples. That's where it originates. There's a lot of Shinto ritual that's still part of, of sumo. Um, if you go to Pancration, right? The origins of Western martial arts. Boxing, wrestling, and Pancration were practiced at the gymnasia. The gymnasia were originally religious groves, right? Plato's Academy. It was the academy before Plato, right? Mm -hmm. The academy was a gymnasia where people met to do physical practices, but that gymnasia had grown up around an olive grove mm. that was a site of worship of Athena. So a lot of these things that seem really separate to us were actually deeply integrated in the kind of cultural traditions from which they originated. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's something so fascinating about that. The, the original link between something like a physical practice and an ethico-aesthetic paradigm. It's like there's a movement practice that is linked to a question of what is what is good to do and how, how is it beautiful to live? Yeah. These are things that we've just completely lost sight of over the years. Yeah, we don't. There's a way in which the body can tell us what's beautiful. The mm. body can tell us what feels good. The body can tell us what is virtuous, mm -hmm. right? Um, which no amount of cogitation can derive in the same way. Mm. Because we're, we're not just, we don't just think, therefore we are, right? Hopefully we don't just. <laughs> I have a... Um, I, I want to get a t-shirt that says movere ergo sum, right? I move, <laughs> therefore I am. Because that's actually much more true, mm. right? Like we, um, if you think back evolutionarily, right? You have self-replicating molecules at some point and they have, they have resources in the environment that they need um, and they have hazards in the environment they need to avoid. And so they've developed the capacity to move, right? Mm -hmm. Like movement is at the foundation of life and mm -hmm. cognition evolves so far down, right? Like nervous systems evolve to give us more sophisticated capacity to move. And, mm -hmm. um, and when we arrive at cognition, right? What is, what is your, your mind for your mind is essentially like a, a space in which you play out potential movement solutions before you act them out. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you can't get real information back to that system in a lot of ways without moving, right? So it's like you have to condition that cognitive capacity to at least some degree based on experiences of the real world that come through movement. Um, I was just rereading, are you familiar at all with Richard Held, some of the experiments he did in the 50s and 60s? No. So he's got this fascinating experiment that he set up and a number of subsequent ones looking at blind kittens for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so he'd link up pairs of kittens. They spent about three mm -hmm. hours a day, I think, in this, and they're on this carousel. Yeah. And one kitten is pulling the other who is the passive then mover through the environment. Yeah. And at the end of this experiment, they introduce them to a, a virtual brink. So you've got the illusion of I'm going to fall yeah. off a cliff and the kittens, even though they were all in the blind condition, the ones who were able to move through the environment responded to the brink as a brink and didn't go near it. Whereas the ones that were passively carted through the environment acted as if they were blind Mm. There's something fundamental there that I, I think is indicated about our movement through an environment 
informing our perception of the environment as well. Yeah, the sensory motor loop. We we cannot actually sense the world without movement. Mm -hmm. um, and movement is always feeding information to the sensory system as the sensory system is moving, is you know is feeding information to the motor system. They're they're intrinsically um, inextricably linked, mm -hmm. and so without perception, then we also can't have thought or imagination or emotion. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, another like. Peterson quote that really hit me was in one of his maps of meaning lecture, he talks about the idea that emotions are downstream of action tendencies, right? Like mm -hmm. negative emotions are telling you to stop or get away. Mm -hmm. Positive emotions are telling you to approach. Like mm -hmm. That's where it starts, right? Like you, you, you know, we were talking about the, the premacy of the mind in this Cartesian worldview, but sort of the replacement to the premacy of the mind has been the premacy of emotions, right? doesn't matter what's objectively true anymore it doesn't matter what's uh you know what intention was it only matters what the emotional impact is right mm -hmm. that's the kind of the, the modern worldview that's replaced that's kind of replacing the cartesian worldview uh, and i think it's equally deranged because it's still not rooted in a real relationship of the body mm -hmm. and so what i see is you have these amplification loops of emotion right so you have an emotion and then you kind of like look into the emotion, which actually just ramps up the emotion because you don't have anything to ground it out to. Yeah. You don't understand why it's doing it. So you see this boom, boom, boom. It, and, um, you know, this is where like Jonathan Hyde has talked about that in the coddling the American mind, where we we're training people to engage in cognitive distortions. Yeah, we're dealing with this widespread dysregulation of affect. Mm -hmm. where it's like you feel a thing, but you can't actually contain and ground what mm -hmm. you are feeling. All that happens then is you act out that affect mm -hmm. in a wildly unregulated way. Yeah. So you're, so if you go back to like, like, you know, what are the fundamental primals of emotion? It's essentially appetite and aversion, right? Mm -hmm. If you imagine yourself as a, um, as a, single celled organism right there's things that will that will that are resources that you need to attain so you have appetite to move towards them mm -hmm. and there are there are things that are threats to you they're toxic or predators or whatever and you need to move away from them mm -hmm. so everything is essentially like based on these two fundamentals right like and then we have arousal and and you know relaxation because right? mm -hmm. you can't be doing stuff all the time so you have a system that's sort of like down and and retreating down and happily appetitive or satiated and then up and approaching or up and getting out or frozen mm -hmm. um, and so all of the more complex emotions in some sense are are derived and built up off of this essential frame which is really just trying to tell your body well, what kind of movement actions it should take Mm -hmm. And then cognition is built on top of that. That's why cognition also doesn't function without emotion, right? Because emotion comes first, right? First you have movement, then you have to have a motivation system that guides movement. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, those two things arise at the same time, basically. Then you develop a cognitive system that allows you to essentially, you know, learn lessons from what happens when you move more effectively. Mm -hmm. And to be able to start to project into the future and say, okay, I can play out these scenarios. What's most likely to be successful? Um, we kind of bring the Darwinian process into our head. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, you know, Descartes sort of takes us all, all the way into the last system that's built and puts mm -hmm. all of our identity and self in that system. Mm -hmm. And then now we're sort of like experiencing then then there's a rejection of that and the grasping onto emotion which is equally um even more unstable in a lot of ways once it's divorced from these other things mm -hmm. yeah it's like you invert the pyramid and you're still not getting to the base of the pyramid the sensory yeah. motor aspect you're just moving one level higher mm -hmm. hmm. I, I'm thinking back, there's one point you and I were talking and we had mentioned just sort of offhand 
this idea that so much of the sense of futility that people experience at this point, the disenchantment maybe that Ber Berman's referring to, is related to the, the stripping of people's affect. It's like if you can't feel what you feel effectively and regulate it, oh, yeah. you have no way to tell what matters, in what way it matters, to what degree it matters. And so you just collapse this whole value hierarchy that could otherwise guide your actions through the world. Yeah. So well, that's interesting because you have kind of two. Sorry. Let me pause for one second. So, um, yeah, you're pointing to this interesting aspect. There's kind of like two directions of the dysregulation of emotion. One is a, is a disconnection from the roots of the emotion or from the emotions itself. And the other is this amplification cycle where we we can't we can't look clearly at what's giving rise to the emotion so the emotion just sort of becomes a vicious cycle mm -hmm. you have emotions about your emotions which cause you more emotions <laughs> <laughs> they never ground out in action yeah um so i think you one thing that i've noticed for instance, is that people who've never had a physical confrontation seem more agitated by verbal confrontation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that people should all be punching it out, but I think that in the developmental stages of life, there's a point at which you actually, kids should let physical conf confrontations happen, or we should let kids have some level of physical confrontation because it's the logical endpoint of a of a conflict right like there's always anytime you're shouting and yelling at somebody you're one step from the potential that there's physical violence mm -hmm. once you've been through a violent physical situation you realize it's not the end of the world like you can survive being punched in the face and it's much better to do it when you're eight years old because eight-year-olds can't really damage each other that badly right if you're if you've never hit anybody and you're a 25 year old male right and you haul off and smack your female partner right like that's very dangerous mm -hmm. so there's like a there's a time and a place developmentally when we're supposed to be exploring aggression and when we don't have an exploration of aggression and conflict and conflict repair that happens properly there we don't know why we have these emotions right we don't know what they're actually about. We haven't, we don't, we don't have a proper grounding for them, you know? Yeah. And I think that uh, people really underestimate that, that aspect of like, why do we feel these things? <laughs> have we been able to play through the scripts enough to actually ground it and to be able to glean the meaning out of the arising of emotion, right? Like with my kids, I always talk about this idea. Your emotions are not wrong, right? They have a reason to arise. And they have to be kind of seen and acknowledged, but they don't, they're not rational. They don't like, they don't tell you just the way the world is. Right? Mm -hmm. Like your being upset about something is not a, objective fact about the world that can't be changed it's actually something that has as much to do with your internal response as to what's happening in the external world mm -hmm. so that doesn't mean you ignore the emotion but it means that you have to think about how you're managing it how you're playing into the emotion mm -hmm. how to dampen that that um that feedback loop if that's what's getting triggered mm -hmm. um and so i think that it, it's interesting i have two girls and a boy my oldest girl is a very prototypically feminine girl. My boy is a very prototypically masculine boy. And then my youngest is a little bit more androgynous. She's very strongly female identified, but she plays really well with boys. She's very rough. She's very bold. Um, but with the girls, it's very much about trying to teach them to learn to recognize that the emotion that they're feeling right now isn't the entirety of the world, right? Mm. That they can that they can step outside of the emotion and take a look at it and mm -hmm. learn to manage it. And also to not manipulate people with their emotions. 
Mm. Particularly my youngest, definitely. You know, she's she's five. She has an eight year old brother. She has a ten year old sister. She's got big people around her. Like she doesn't have that many tools at her disposal to try to impose power on people, right? And she's not that cognitively sophisticated yet. She's very smart for her age, but still, right? It makes sense that she's going to use the powers that she has, right? So crying, screaming, these things. Mm-hmm. I think this is typical of, of youngest children, but um, but still, it's like recognize what you're doing, step back from it. Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm, I'm always trying to be really careful about like not shutting down the emotions that are necessary. So it's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel sad. It's not okay to just keep screaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with my, my boy, he's very stoic by nature. He doesn't like to show emotion. He doesn't. Um, yeah. He, if he's upset, he'll usually turn away he doesn't want to be comforted he doesn't want to be talked to he wants to the space he's he'll frequently deny that he's upset about stuff when he's upset Mm -hmm. and so with him i'm always talking to him about like it's okay right like you feel scared right now you don't need to be ashamed of feeling scared i've been scared lots and lots of times some of the most important moments in my life, things I've accomplished, you know, really amazing things. I was really scared when that was happening, Mm -hmm. right? Or you're angry or you're sad. Like all those things are legitimate, but his inherent temperament seems to lead him towards wanting to push down emotions. Mm -hmm. And so we have the, that, 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 those two tendencies. One is to let the emotion ramp up either as a, just because you can't see outside of it or not, you're not able to metacognitive, you know, do a metacognition about your emotion or two, because it's actually a tool of manipulation maybe the only tool of manipulation available to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other tendency is to sort of be like, if I don't acknowledge it, it's not real. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. There's this psychoanalyst named Ignacio Matablanco who tried to apply principles of set theory to Freudian doctrine to make a little more sense out of what's happening in psychopathologies. And he talks about these two modes, this antimony that arises. There's the asymmetrical mode that we tend to relate to, call it conscious function, clear distinctions, this is this, that is that. And then there's the symmetrical mode, which is a little more focused on the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. The example he gives is to the unconscious, for instance, Peter is the father of John is the same thing as John is the father of Peter. It's the fatherness that matters. Mm. And he describes that emotional experience is really closely related. Whether you're mad at me or I'm mad at you, at a certain point, there is anger between us. And that's how we're both responding. And he says that these things can stretch up to infinite experiences. And so when you're saying we got to be able to like step out of this, observe it, contain it, get a sense of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I think it's such an important capacity. And likewise, to, to have access to that, not only to be so focused on that asymmetrizing tendency or the maybe the overly rational tendency, I suppose we might say. Yeah. Yeah. We need to balance reason and intuition and it has to ground out in, in capacity, right? Like mm-hmm. you gotta be able to do stuff. <laughs> At the end of the day. Yeah. It's, uh, but I mean, that's the reality of the modern world is that most people can't do stuff. Right? Mm-hmm. They can only do a very narrow bandwidth of stuff. So I think of this as, um, this is one of my little pet peeves or things that I think about a lot, which is, I'm I'm generally kind of more on the conservative side. I'm pro free market, um, but I I think that there are real important criticisms of capitalism, and I think a lot of the the left wing sort of solutions don't necessarily work, but they point to real problems. One of the huge problems that I see with capitalism is this um, is this it it atomizes people in a variety of different ways. It narrows people mm-hmm. because capital flows best when it's fungible. So the more that you can take human capacities and make them fungible, 
human values and make them fungible than the, the more that they're basically cap capturable in capital. Um, but that's not actually good for human well-being. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways this happens is that we, you know, capitalism works off of comparative advantage. If there's something that I do 3% better than anybody else, I can capture the most value potentially by doing only that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you do something else a little bit better and then we get to trade, right? And so there's an efficiency that comes. Um, and that, you know, like that's why we get certain things from China and certain things from Mexico and 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 overall it has floated many boats in a very positive way. But the downside, the cost is that it incentivizes people to not invest in competencies that are outside of their core earning capacity. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is that across the board, we are sacrificing fundamental aspects of our humanity to a professional class that specializes in them. So music, right? If you exist before the radio, your opportunities to listen to music produced by professionals is going to be very limited. Mm -hmm. So everybody basically learns to sing and play an instrument because music is really, really powerful for human beings. And so you just kind of have to have some competency in music. So mm -hmm. every community has some people who are really good at music. Um, some people who, you know, just barely hold a beat in the background. <laughs> but there's an expectation that you are going to have some level of music skill. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets to participate in music. Music is something that is participatory. Um, now music is something that is consumed. Mm -hmm. And, our, and our, our comparison set isn't the best singer in our village of 150 people. Right, it's the best singer in the world, aided mm -hmm. on the best day, <laughs> aided by technology. Mm -hmm. Right, so everyone's like, "I can't sing. I'm not a good singer. I don't have rhythm." It's like, well, you're comparing yourself to cyborgs, really. <laughs> right? So true. <laughs> so we don't sing. Okay, we don't cook. Right. Once again, like before fast food restaurants, before widespread restaurant uses, you have to cook your own food. Every family takes pride in something about their food, right? This is something you can think about. Like Italian grandmas, right? Like that's that's a holder of tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more people don't cook, right? We leave that to professionals. Yeah. We don't dance. We leave that to professionals. We don't do parkour. We leave that to professionals. Literally, we don't even have sex. Mm -hmm. right if you look at the rates of pornography consumption and the rates of actual sex mm -hmm. after the internet and the explosion of pornography the rate at which people are actually choosing to have sex in real life with each other is going down we are mm -hmm. literally sacrificing the core reproductive act the core sort of connective act between you know between people mm -hmm. to professionals Mm -hmm. and augmented professionals mm -hmm. professionals who can who are airbrushed you know and and have bolt-on breasts and penis <laughs> enlargement and are on viagra right like so our once again our expectations of what sexuality are mm -hmm. are um are absurdly inflated and most people don't feel like they can live up to it they're not able to to achieve the aesthetic standards they're not able to achieve the the um the the performance standards and and the even the way that we have sex is designed the way that professional sex is applied is is done in a way to manipulate hyper stimulation pathways in the brain that aren't that closely related to what actually makes sex good for people in real life yeah yeah and and so this is this is a huge problem right because all of those things are actually the sources of our connection with the world and with other human beings and with ourselves. They're ways in which we learn about ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, in the 1970s, we were worried because because young people were having too much sex. <laughs> now we're worried because they don't have sex. They, they delay sex 
until they're into their 20s, right? Something like, I think it's like 30% of young men between 18 and 25 um, have not had sex in the last year. Hmm. Um, and it's like 18% of young women. Hmm. The, like that, that the struggle to, to find a partner, to deal with a partner, to make a relationship work, to like all of that is deeply informational, right? It's deeply like informs you. It, it helps you become who you are. Like I am who I am in so many ways and because of this interplay that I've had over the last 21 years with my, with my wife uh, mm-hmm. or 20 years, almost 20 years now. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't wrestle. We let professionals do it. It, it. You know, it just goes on and on and on. So the core idea behind my work is fundamentally the problem that we have with meaning in our culture is that meaning arises from well-attuned connections. And the things that connect us to ourselves, right? What are our emotions? Why do they arise? How do we manage them? How do they interact, right? How do you balance lust with anger? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, fatigue with hunger. <laughs> um, like there's all these little components of the self. How do we get those better integrated, better communicating, better attuned, better in harmony? And then how do we have this harmonious self in a harmonious relationship to the world external to us? How do we then integrate that self with the social relational world of other agents and beings and then mm-hmm. to higher order principles and powers and um, the sense of the past and the future and all those elements. But I think that we, we've we sacrificed something really, really important um, in, in what actually builds those connections. Mm -hmm. yeah there's this profound disconnection from the the roots of our participation in the world Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah the the professionalization of the core aspects of human human behavior right i i find myself really curious i don't know that i'd actually considered it that way but what you had mentioned before related to one of the the critiques of capitalism is that it leads people to reduce themselves mm. and to hyper specialize which yeah. has some some benefits of course but then i i also wonder one of the key aspects of a practice that well, practice that you're developing is this general tendency how did we develop actual generalist movers let's say yeah. and i know that you have you have some very specific thoughts on what constitutes a genuine generalist mover. Yeah. And I wonder, because you've been fleshing some of this out recently, I wonder if you could maybe talk through some of those ideas. Sure. Yeah. So the generalist, um, I, I had an interesting conversation with John Rebecca about this, about how essentially, you know, movement is maybe the best lens to start with, but we have this problem throughout human life, which is that the the set of all the things available to us is infinite right the ways that we could behave the things that we could do that and we have to somehow arrow into what are the relevant things for us to do so my critique of uh movement culture and crossfit before that is that i don't think they dug into the question of what is the relevant aspects of movement deeply so you can be a movement generalist and you could you could just pick and choose any number of things and now you're you know you're kind of you're doing more than one thing you're not a specialist but is it is it building something that's integrated Hmm. and is it building something that is essentially fundamentally congruent with human nature so I think of what I'm trying to do with, with 
with thinking about generalist human movement as a kind of like the embodiment of relevance realization, right? What, how do I become, how do I train such that I become better attuned to the most important physical relationships in the world and better able to adapt and be in harmony and be productive in those kind of relationships? Um, so I think, you know, where I start with that is what is a human being? How does it, you know, what are its core relationships? Mm -hmm. So from a movement perspective, you have, you know, my thinking started on this line when, after I discovered parkour, after I discovered parkour, I thought of it as a kind of like heroic art. And I had already done gymnastics, I'd already done martial arts. And so I was like, I wanted to integrate these because they felt like the feats of heroes of old, right? And so I started thinking about how all these things could come together and how I could have a practice that incorporated all of these. And then I encountered the work of uh, Georges Hubert um, in yeah. Méthode Naturelle. And he talked about 10 fundamental capacities of movement. Walk, run, jump, climb, move on all fours, balance, swim, lift, carry, and defend yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was working with Erwin LaCour on what became MoveNet, he wanted to expand the list from 10 to 12 and then 14. So we had to add uh, throwing and catching, which, you know, makes sense. Um, and sorry, I think it's lift and throw. And then, mm -hmm. But it, in any event, so we wanted to add carry and catch because obviously those are corollaries of this. And then you, and then I was like, well, you can kind of subdivide it as many times as you want. You can take something like self-defense and say, well, you have self-defense with weapons and you have self-defense unarmed. Under self-defense with uh, unarmed, you have striking and grappling. You have ground grappling and standing grappling. You have uh, hand strikes versus foot strikes versus elbow strikes versus knee strikes. Um, there's sort of like an infinite number of ways to start sort of expanding the list. So I thought like, okay, how do we, is there is there a higher order principle that we can organize these under? And so I came up with the idea of locomotive, manipulative, and combative. And this was after I left working with MoveNet. Um, so that, that was my original conception of it, right? Because if you take those, you know, self-defense, combative, lift, throw, uh, manipulative, and then the rest of them are basically locomotive. Mm -hmm. Now, I then was inspired by the work of Frank Ferencic, and I started digging into the play research. And the play research came back with three fundamental uh, types of physical play. So there's narrative play and role-taking play and all these uh, other kinds of play. But when it comes to just the things that kids, human children physically do, they engage in locomotor exploratory play, mm -hmm. object-oriented play, and rough and tumble play. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this fourth kind of interesting category, which is dance. Um, so we'll touch on that. So then I was kind of always stuck because I was like, how does dance fit into this? And like, if you go back to Hebert's method, dance is weird. Like he basically puts it in for women and not for men, at least for some period of time, <laughs> which is weird. Um, yeah. But what I realized over time was that rather than combative as the top of that hierarchy or the, not the top of the hierarchy, but as the third category, it made more sense to actually uh, widen that to interactions anything that has two moving agents you mm -hmm. have cooperative and then you can divide that into cooperative versus combative or cooperative versus antagonistic um so then you have those three levels and then you can see that actually we can dance at every level so dance sort of ex exists as a category within all of them mm -hmm. so my fundamental thinking is that these are these are the ways that we can relate to the world right we can relate to the world by moving ourselves through it by moving the things in it or by moving with the other living things in a combative or uh, cooperative way. Um, and then we can do that in ways that are utilitarian or expressive. And dance is the expressive side of it. So for me, a complete generalist movement practice has to be, has to incorporate all of those and should be trying to incorporate all of those in a way that optimizes for transfer, right? So mm -hmm. I want to train so that I get better at parkour but also so that that parkour will make me better at as many other things as possible, including being a more sensitive husband, a better father, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then we want to apply. We, we know that there is these transfers. 
but we also know that they don't necessarily happen consistently. And so we have to apply principles. We're trying to extract the transfer and trying to create far transfer across as many uh, sets of, of, of capacities as possible. So um, roughly, I would say that the, the foundational practices are something like parkour, um, because every human child and essentially literally all, all animals engage in locomotor exploratory play. Mm -hmm. And all animals essentially engage in rough and tumble play. Uh, Object-oriented play is less, I mean, it, it happens. It's not as big a thing for animals that aren't tool using animals. Mm -hmm. But for humans, it's big. For other great apes, it's kind of big. Um, even wolves love to like chase, you know, balls like oh, yeah. cats right cats love balls yeah. um string so we we do have that object oriented play um so but parkour kind of reflects the way that kids intrinsically do this the most right mm -hmm. kids don't inherently just do like formal gymnastics they don't inherently just do like formal track and field those are both abstractions of this underlying exploratory locomotor play but parkour captures that the best. And I have a variety of theory of, around why I think that parkour actually creates the most transfer and the most capacity because it taps into the flow state the best. It activates the play circuitry the most effectively. It creates the most sort of breadth of, of connections in coordination. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that parkour is limited because we don't swim, because it's not necessarily focused on moving in nature and because it doesn't have a, like an aerobic capacity right uh development so the way that i like to think about parkour is let's do that but then let's try to do as much as possible in nature let's make sure we're getting some longer uh mm -hmm. runs in there and you know and then add the rough and tumble and the interaction into it mm -hmm. um and then i think it's really the most and, and swim and that's the fundamental like locomotor aspect uh and then when we look at uh the object oriented aspect uh, this is one, uh, let's skip that and come back to that one, because I think that's the hardest one to think about, actually, mm -hmm. because it's it's the most specific to human beings in a way. Mm -hmm. um, when we go to the, the rough housing aspect of it, like basically kids like to wrestle first and then they learn to strike later. Mm -hmm. um, striking is more challenging. Also, like wrestling is culturally universal and like systems of striking aren't that culturally universal. Um Mostly humans probably evolved to strike things with sticks and rocks and like using fists is a sort of like, uh, it's a, it's a way of trying to behave as if you have a rock to hit something with when you just <laughs> turn your hand into a rock. Um, so I like to root it in wrestling and then expand into the striking arts, even though I personally have a bigger background and prefer the striking arts. And then I think that, uh, the, the martial arts tend not to understand some of the dynamics of play and how a good culture of play that's developed by children over time will have self-handicapping and will have rapport building and will have connection built into it. Mm -hmm. And that's not addressed in most approaches to martial arts. And so what we've done is gone and applied the theory of play and um, really a lot of drills that come out of the contact improv community. And so it's sort of the way we look at roughhousing kind of combines mixed martial arts, the grappling bias, and um, and a little bit of like weapons martial arts, historical European martial arts, et cetera, um, and contact improv. And uh, uh, Capoeira is also really, really powerful and a great system that captures a lot of beautiful stuff. And then, you know, African dance, hip hop, there's a lot of stuff that you could kind of bring into that melange that would be really beautiful. Um, but that's sort of that, that, uh, that approach. And then the object oriented stuff is interesting because so you wrestle because that's how a human being fights, right? You, you, you jump and climb like the, it's constrained by the body and the type of environment that you have. Mm -hmm. The types of, of, of object oriented play that kids engage in is really reflective of the tool culture of their region. Right. Mm. And the output of it is like being able to do stuff with your hands. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I think long term, like bushcraft is a really great way to express the, the, the 
the object oriented aspect of your play. Um, just any kind of craft, you know, whether it's ceramics or woodworking or whatever, those are all actually aspects of this general motor capacitor. What we tend to play with the most in um, in our workshops is just games with balls and sticks and ropes, because these are fundamental forms of, these are fundamental tools that are played with everywhere mm -hmm. and that are really good for building general movement dexterity. Mm -hmm. But like, if you imagine a really complete approach to movement culture, it would maybe look at hunting and fishing and crafting as like these fundamental expressions of that, that higher order principle. Um, and then when we get to the dance aspect, you, you want to be able to dance with a partner, dance by yourself, dance in a group. Um, I really like African derived forms of dance because of the, I think they have the highest transferability because of the, the extremely sophisticated approach to rhythm and the diversity of body movement that's involved in them. Mm -hmm. So capoeira, hip hop, and African dance are kind of like the things that I really think have the most to teach us. Mm -hmm. That's my personal kind of take on it. So I'm, I'm hoping to get back in a couple out of myself uh, here in the next few weeks. Um, because as a martial artist, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very friendly dance to be involved in. Um, but it, it contains so many elements that are really deep and rich. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the overall structure of my thinking, you know, <laughs> I could go deeper, but I, you know, it gets so it gets a little. Now I'm just reading the essay to you. Well, sure, yeah, but I. So I'm curious in terms of most effectively developing your skill and transferring mm -hmm. what is afforded through each of these practices. How how can we lean into some of the transfer as a general life practice? Like you said, how do I practice parkour in a, make, a way that makes me a better husband, a better father? What do you think in terms of developing that you know, metaphorical? Yeah, so um, I think there's a kind of interesting intersection between mindfulness and uh, and movement that really affords this transformation. So starting to journal, starting to engage in active kind of um, active imagination. Mm -hmm. exercises with your practices so you're you're not just doing the practice but you're actually reflecting on the practice and you're actually thinking about it as an intention of like am i getting the courage from this jump to the situations where i need it mm -hmm. um am i taking the equanimity i'm developing in my practice and it's showing up in this other place uh one layer that i didn't actually talk about and this is kind of the layer that is your specialty is I call it the body integrity layer. I was listening to Ido Portal recently, and he essentially had come up with a very similar schema of movement, right? Mm -hmm. There's like the, the environmental aspect of movement, the, the, the partnering aspect of movement, the object oriented aspect of movement, and the somatic layer of movement, mm -hmm. which was the term he used was a somatic layer. I think of this as the body integrity. Now, the way that I've been thinking about it is that you you need to attend to the so there's a relationship of the body to the external environment the relationship of the body to the aspects of the external environment we can manipulate and move around and then the aspects of the people or the other living beings right because like uh cooperating or taming a horse or a dog is also like that interactive aspect mm -hmm. but then there's this act, uh, aspect of like do i understand what my shoulder is doing better <laughs> Right? Can I? Can I? When I have a little hitch in my shoulder, can I? Can I feed myself capacity to overcome that? Can I actively calm the system down? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, it's 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 there's kind of a lot of stuff that can go in there because something like heavy squatting is like a to me it's like a yeah it's lifting and object manipulation but it's really not a very sophisticated object manipulation challenge mm -hmm. it's really about just learning to make the body do body things well right mm -hmm. um and then there's the somat the like you know traditional somatics um and aspects of dance can come in here you know body movement therapies all these things even the seated practice can be understood or the lying practice body scans 
as really about attending to these relationships, the relationships internal to the body, the breath work. All of that, to me, is sort of capturable within this, this category. But I think that category is really key as a place in which we go to to start that loop of transferring it to the other aspects outside of it. So we can have, you know, from a, again, not an internal martial artist really, or someone from a strong Chinese background, but my understanding of it is that this is a real focus of the internal martial arts. And the internal martial arts themselves are kind of foundational. It's like a, the internal martial arts and yoga, I think are really the, the foundation of the somatics practices. Mm. Um, but there's that that sense of it's not just how hard you hit, but really attending to the way in which it's produced in the body, mm-hmm. and then that changing the whole way that you're moving through and interacting with that, and all of that essentially being related actually to spiritual cultivation practices. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you've had my friend Simon on your channel yet. Um, no, I'd love to. You should definitely have us chat with Simon. Cool. But Simon's ancestral movement approach is very, very closely aligned to Evolve Move Play. And they evolved um, essentially separately to the same sort of place. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we've taught together and interacted a lot. So our stuff has 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 colonized each other's stuff. But it but we arrived at like these are the things that you should be doing in the parkour, the martial arts, etc. Really independently but we arrive from very different places i started with hard martial or like you know external martial arts and um so i started in tang sudo i did do aikido but then i moved over to like a northern style of kung fu and then muay thai and brazilian jiu-jitsu um and then gymnastics and then parkour right um and then meditation came late and all the all those kind of things came late for me simon I think starts in the Asian martial arts, in the internal martial arts, and then goes deep into the meditative practices, does a ton of capoeira, goes to Asia and spends, I think, 10 years in between India and China studying Hmm. the meditative practices. And then he comes back and then integrates it with bushcraft and all the things that he's doing. Um, But he has a very, very deep experience of yogic practice and Taoist practices. And so he has some really beautiful ways of sort of integrating that perspective. Hmm. And now I can't remember what prompted me to, to to, uh, talk about his work, but I think there's an interesting way in which that, that yogic internal martial arts perspective that he brings really kind of, um, it it opens up or amplifies aspects of the practice that are less developed within evolved move play whereas mm-hmm. the aspects of the martial arts or the, the technical aspects of martial arts the technical aspects of the parkour are more amplified in what we're doing hmm. it brings to mind the idea in so much the way that i was taught to approach something like the feldenkrais method is not to think of it as oh, how do i fix my achy bakey back for instance but it's how do I become skillful in the manner of organization in my activity mm-hmm. so that I could apply myself effectively, whether I am picking up the barbell on a deadlift, whether I am wiping my ass, whether I am having a difficult conversation with my partner, how am I organized in each of these activities? And yeah. what does that manner of organization mean for how I am mm-hmm. in that activity, what I am, who I am? And Man, I think there's something so significant there. There's a. Have you ever seen um, the Jackie Chan Karate Kid movie? Oh God, it's been years. Yeah. So there's a scene where Jaden Smith's character is like being really sloppy, putting on his jacket, <laughs> just like thoughtless. Mm-hmm. And Jackie makes him put on his jacket over and over and over again, right? And and he can't he can't understand why. And then it's like, okay, well, it's actually a martial arts technique underneath it. But that's bullshit. But but what he said that stuck in my mind is, the kung fu lives in everything you do. 
And that's what that's what you're trying to do. And um, I think that's the same it's the same idea within yoga, right? So I <laughs> I grew up with two. I grew up in the counterculture. My dad is a hippie icon. Um, anyone who is not yet aware of him or doesn't know about my connection with Sunray <laughs> Kelly, look it up. Lots of people end up independently following me and my dad, and they're like, "What? You guys are related?" Um, <laughs> I grew up, you know, going to the barter fair and the Oregon Country Fair and the Rainbow Gathering and protests and that whole world. Um, and both my parents were yoga teachers at one time. My dad went to India and spent time in ashrams meditating and doing all this stuff. So I learned like a lot of the yoga, the asana when I was young, and I was naturally really good at them because I was very flexible and strong by nature. Um, and then I was just like, I'm not interested in this. <laughs> and, and it's always been associated to me with aspects of our culture that I'm very skeptical about yoga, right? Mm -hmm. so, so yoga of all the like kind of, I mean, it's the biggest brand in all of physical culture by a huge margin, right? Mm -hmm. Which is weird because it's not, that's not what it means. It's not, it's not, asana is not the, the core <laughs> of yoga. But um, uh, another one of my friends is Yepi Skogo, who runs uh, Holt, which is, uh, that means touched, I think, in Dutch, which is a, which is a movement studio in Copenhagen. And Yepi was a parkour um, athlete. He was one of these guys who's naturally incredibly strong and muscular. And he, uh, you know, they called him Hulk because he was so powerful. Hmm. So apparently he got to the point where he had so much tension in his muscles. He was so powerful that it actually constricted his own breathing to the point where he passed out. Oof. So he he had so much capacity for tension that he, he became a threat to his own life. <laughs> and so he discovered yoga and he became a guy who's like incorporating the, the concepts of parkour and the concepts of yoga together. And then he's also bringing all the movement culture stuff in hmm. to... Uh, to this but he essentially explained to me that like yoga means the yoke right and it's it is it's very much like parkour when like the philosophical aspect of parkour it's not a set of exercises that you do it's a way of interacting with the world mm. that you're trying to cultivate and so in some sense, like you do Tai Chi Shuang, you, you want to become a better martial artist and Tai Chi guys really should be better martial artists than most of them are. But that's, that's not the primary purpose. You do Tai Chi to express Taoism. Mm -hmm. You do Tai Chi to become, to, to learn to be in right relationship to the Tao, to the way. You mm -hmm. do yoga not so you can touch your head with your butt <laughs> you do yoga because it allows you to pick up the yoke of existence in the right relationship mm -hmm. you do parkour because it teaches you the transformative power of overcoming obstacles right like ryan holiday wrote that book the obstacle is the way i haven't mm -hmm. read that book i need to read that book but it's about stoicism but i'm like that's parkour right <laughs> Like I've, I've often said that I think that parkour is, is motor behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. right? So it's cognitive behavioral therapy, but we're actually taking that same principle of exposure therapy. That's basically what we're doing. And we're expressing it physically every day. Right. No, this is why I was so entranced by Peterson as well. When I come across Peterson, which is like, is describing in such beautiful, articulated, you know, language with references that span the gamut from, you know, existentialist philosophy to deep neurobiology to religious and mythological ideas. He's expressing this fundamental idea, which is that the way you grow as a human being is you can voluntarily confront dragons. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's what we're doing when a person goes out to do parkour they're going out and finding these little chaotic moments elements challenges that bring forth their capacity to be creative and to solve problems 
Mm -hmm. By doing so, they become a better problem solver. Now, if you, now, uh, Jonathan Haidt in that book, The Coddling of the American Mind, one of the big points is that cognitive behavioral therapy is basically a system that reflects stoicism. They're almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we can we can actually hybridize them, right? Like there's there's a wisdom in the old Stoic traditions that maybe isn't even captured fully in cognitive behavioral therapy. But we can look at Stoicism through that lens or vice versa and see that there's a relationship. The Stoics believed that the that the um, that the process of philosophy was wrestling brought to the mind mm. and that wrestling was the foundational education and i think what they saw in wrestling you can equally see in parkour mm. but if you if you combine the stoicism the taoism etc with the physical practices that's when you have the most power for self-transformation mm. It is such a deeply existential practice, too. I think the existential givens, it's like you're embodied in a shared world with others unto death. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you can move well along the way. You want to make sure you can play nicely and kick ass if need be. And I hope to God it's meaningful. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I kind of want to tell you a little bit. Of, I mean, you know, but the audience won't know. Like... Because it's been very interesting. I've been a very interesting place, right? So I I started parkour 17 years ago. I was one of the first generation athletes, probably like maybe a hundred or so people were doing it in North America at that point. Um, and of those hundred, you know, there's probably a dozen of us who are still practicing. Hmm. So that practice was transformational to me. Before that in my life, martial arts had been completely transformational to me. So I had these two experiences of that. And then I started seeing these transformations in my students. And then I started not seeing the transformations in my students, asking why do some people transform and others don't? How do I afford what felt so meaningful to me to other people? And then mm -hmm. I went deep down this rabbit hole of what is meaning and how do I understand it? How do I grow? What's my map to meaning, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I brought in elements from from mindfulness practices, from somatic practices, from, from all these things, from player research. And so I built this really big ecology of practices, really deep theory behind it. And one of the things that I've always talked about is this idea that it's it's too much, right? Like, okay, so we go back to what is the generalist mover? Okay, so you, oh, and I didn't mention team sport, which I also think is a really powerful way of integrating them. Not necessary necessarily, but really, really powerful. Um, you know, you think about the combative, locomotive, um, object manipulation, cooperative, it's all there. Mm -hmm. right? So maybe a complete movement practice is something like do parkour, do some strength training, do some maybe yoga or internal martial arts style practices, somatics, you know, uh, juggle, throw, play with objects in some way, play games with objects. Um, practice martial arts mixed with contact improv, maybe play a team sport, get some cup butter in there. It's like, okay, where are you going to fit this all in? Mm. Oh, then you got to do your, your mindfulness practices. Now you're journaling. <laughs> how, how do you build it? Uh, it's, it's, it sounds amazing on paper and it is amazing if you can put it into practice. But if you start at, you know, if you see the the overarching picture, it can feel like you're starting to, you're, it's just a, like a giant castle that you have to build, right? And it's like, what is the first stone that I need to set? Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that I've always told people is the, the stone that you need to set is the thing that you can most easily fall in love with. Mm -hmm. And And ultimately, I actually think that's the right way to think about the practice too, is that the ultimate purpose of the practice is to fall more deeply in love with the experience of being. That's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. So, so I start, so parkour is the base for me. Now that doesn't mean it has to be the base for you. Like I have a theory for why parkour, I think is maybe the best base in, in a lot of ways, because it's, it's essentially fundamentally the, the origin of play. It's what everybody small kid does. But if you watch a bunch of, if you're a say artistic 
feminine character person, young woman maybe, who's a little bit uh, physically shy, scared of heights. And you watch these guys doing flips between buildings. Like the kinesthetic connection, it's not there. It's overwhelming. The very word parkour, it's actually pushing you out and away. Mm -hmm. But maybe dance is like, oh, that's that's my hook. That's I man, when I dance, I love it. It connects me to things that I that I want to do. That's how you feel. And I've had this experience. I've taken people who've said, I'm really scared of parkour. And then like, okay, we're gonna do this dance thing, and we're just gonna have some objects in the way and you can go over them and interact with them and like boom it's amazing it's beautiful they love it mm -hmm. so maybe it's dance for you or maybe you're someone who has a lot of natural aggression and needs to express it or super kinesthetic and just really likes being in vigorous contact with somebody else's body and so maybe martial arts is the base for you maybe you just really need to go inside and somatics is the base for you but whatever it is you got to fall in love with it so what happened for me over the last year is I've been struggling with some kind of chronic fatigue issue since 2015, which it's looking more and more like it's, I'm, I'm fairly certain now it's because of mold exposure. And now that I'm getting out of the mold exposure, things are better. But so I built this thing. It was great. My body, you know, I'm still performing at a very high level late into my thirties, but I'll have weeks where I just literally can't get off the couch and I have IBS. I've got, my gut is just a complete mess. And then COVID happens. <laughs> and over the course of COVID, like, you know, we lose a hundred thousand dollars in retreat tickets that, you know, and we have to refund $24,000 in retreat tickets. Um, we lose a hundred thousand of expected revenue, have to refund 24,000, have to completely change our business model, chase all these different things, end up struggling, almost breaks my marriage. Now I'm trying to recover, right? I didn't get to train at all from basically June through November of, uh, or through October of, of 2020. And so my body completely changed. It was not a good time. Um, and so I get better. You know, I get a lot stronger and then retreat season hits again and it crushes me. I just, I didn't have the energy resources to be ready for it in 2021. And then I sprained my ankle really badly hmm. at the end of that. Just, I think, a habit of fatigue. So I'm kind of like, 2022, it's getting better. Things are getting better. But again, the retreat season just wipes me out completely. So I arrive in October of 2022 and... Once again, my weight's floated up to a level that I'm really not happy with. I'm tired, like, and I'm sore all the time. Like if I train sometimes, it'll take me up to nine days to recover from my training. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm 40, almost 41. And it's like, is, is this just over for me? Right? I've built this idea. It's beautiful, but I'm like, I'm breaking, right? Like holding the, holding the burden of bringing this to the world is breaking me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's when I reached out to you. And so, you know, you and I started working on my mental health. I worked out to, to my friend, John Mitchell. He started working with me on the, the biological aspect of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was a long process. It like took a while. And I sprained my other ankle uh, at the end of October. And I knew that I sprained my ankle because of the fatigue, right? It was like, it wasn't technical. It wasn't anything else. It was just like, I was so fatigued that my body was just not behaving normally. Mm. So missing signals. But I got in the gym and I started doing it. And I stopped meditating. I stopped doing internal martial arts practices. I stopped doing nature connection practices. I stopped everything except parkour and strength training. Mm. Because I could only afford to invest myself in a very little bit. I had such a small bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And for me, it hurt more. It wasn't, it wasn't love, actually. It was maybe it was the, the 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 inverse of love, which was the pain of losing my skills. Mm -hmm. Right. To feel like I had been able to do these things and they felt so good to me and they were so meaningful to me. And I just I just couldn't do them anymore, right? Mm -hmm. 
it was so painful that it was like that that's the anchor of my practice right i will go back and i will build this skill and i will and i will do the strength training because i know that my body needs it in order to access these skills mm -hmm. and so i had to take this whole ecology practice and collapse it down to just two pieces um and and it was frustrating right like in october i got like four colds and so i'd make i'd be making some progress i'd get better like i'd see that that my skills were starting to grow and then i'd get sick and then sick um but then it started to turn over and then it started to come back and then it was interesting because i started to do this thing where i i don't like uh, uh, one of the things I picked up was walking, right? I just trying to walk 10,000 steps every day. And I, I live next to a beautiful park. Um, so I get to walk in the beautiful park. And when I was walking in October and September, my, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't set out to think about anything. I would let my mind run, but I would pay attention to what was happening. Mm -hmm. So in September, or October, my mind would run on why am I so tired? How can I get out of being so tired? Why am I not getting results despite eating well and training well? And like all these things, like, will I ever not be injured again? Like what, you know, like these are the thoughts that were just running in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then as the results start to come back, now, now I'm getting fitter, I'm getting stronger, et cetera. Now I'm thinking it's working <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's all, it's all internal. It's like in, in three weeks, I might be here here's what's going to come next here's what i need to do here's how i'm going to commit to this here's this little tweak that i'm going to do and so for for a long time like if i walk and i let my brain flow like it's entirely obsessed with my health my body composition and my skills and strength mm -hmm. and that's not really what i want to be attending to necessarily but i knew that i just had to let it be what it was and then just within the last few weeks, it's like, now I'm like, okay, maybe I can do some capoeira. Maybe I can do some dance, right? Maybe I can start to incorporate this, right? I have friends who are moving to town. We're going to be able to do these things together. Um, and then like starting to think about how my ideas connect to John Rebecki's ideas and Jordan Peterson's ideas and Jonathan Haidt's ideas, ideas for essays, all that stuff is starting to oh, churn. Mm -hmm. And to me, those are all beautiful signals of vitality, right? Where I was last year, a couple months down the line, is now when I was going on walks, I was actually not thinking hardly at all. I was attuned to the natural world. My attention was on the birds. My mm -hmm. attention was on the trees. My attention was on the way that the nature around me was changing. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the space of connection that I'm aiming to get back to. But I wanted to tell that story because, because it, to me, it's really important that you can see the breadth of what the optimal expression of this is. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, like, sometimes you just need that first stone and you got to figure out what it is for you. And having the whole theory of everything, it's not going to get you there. You need to know what your stone is. Right? And for me, it was like, I needed the branch that I could grab onto in the raging river that was pulling me mm -hmm. downstream that would allow me to just like get to shore mm -hmm. and hating not being good at parkour was my branch. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh God. I, I do think there's so much of value in that story mm -hmm. because you're, you're an incredible physical specimen who is capable of this like broader range of skills and you're so goddamn smart as i said and and at the same time like any complex system has vulnerabilities right and mm -hmm. and what i really glean from that particular story is a couple of things one the idea of system reliability it's like you got to figure out what is the most reliable part of this yeah. if all the rest is going to shit what can we count on hone in on at least 
remind ourselves of our capacity. Mm -hmm. And that might involve stripping away things that are less reliable at this point, which may have huge upside, but are less reliable. And then the other thing is, how do I raise the floor? How do I make my lows not quite mm -hmm. so low? Yeah. I can get back to the pinnacle performance, but if I can make my worst just mm -hmm. a bit better, yeah. A, way easier than making the bests better. And B, it's, God, I mean, sometimes I, I think about my lowest points and it's like, well, thank God I can get up and down from the ground. Like if that's all I can do today, I'm not dead yet. And I can get up and down from the ground. All right. Yeah. I can meet the day. <laughs> Thankful for small blessings. Yeah. God. Hmm. One, of the, one of the other anchors has been uh, systems of feedback. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was something I, I worked with a personal trainer last year. He helped me set up like a, just a good spreadsheet. And then I adapted it. One of the things that I did with my spreadsheet is I, coded every workout so that if I have a decrement in performance, it's red. If I have a, a kind of steady state of performance, it's in black. And if it's a, um, if it's a mm, sort of training cycle PR, it's in green. Mm -hmm. So then I get this feedback every time that, you know, like I look at the document and I see, okay, green, 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 things are going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, now I have a, I have one for, my my body composition and one for my symptoms of the IBS and uh, and, uh, and chronic fatigue, and so it's interesting because so much of my work has been around on the the power of play and how play is this extraordinarily informational thing and educational thing, and play can be kind of at odds. And also, we were talking about that intuition, reason thing, right? So should I train? Should I? Should I train um, based on intuition and feel, or should I train based on reason? Mm -hmm. And so, so having like three spreadsheets that guide your training practice, like that's a very rational, modern, you know, mm -hmm. Cartesian approach to training in a way. Mm -hmm. Really working for me, really provided an incredible anchor for me. But one of the things I did, which is interesting, and I really have come to believe in this, is. Like traditionally, like if you hire a, a good personal trainer, what they'll do is they'll write you a program. And they'll be like, okay, this week you're going to, so we're going to test your, say, squat max. And then this week we're going to start at 75% of your squat max for three times seven and work our way up, right? I don't really believe in that very much anymore, right? Like friend, you know, you'll have your aerobic block and this block and that block. Friends Bosch was sort of like, if you look at the research on this, like, you can't tell the difference between different approaches to, to periodization. We don't have good data on what type of periodization works. What's clear is that variation over time helps. It's like you want to intensify over time, you need back offs, and you need to not do the same exact program all the time. That's that's basically it. Mm -hmm. So what I realized was that I, the program didn't have to be super detailed. Just had to have clear goals and reasonable goals. Mm -hmm. And for me, luckily, I like I, I know it's reasonable for me because I, I know what I've done in the past at this point, right? So like, okay, last year we were able to add six inches to my my broad jump. So this year we're gonna aim to add six inches to my broad jump. That's that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um and then I track it, right? The tracking with detail. It's like the feedback systems are so good. So the intuition is I show up at the session and I say, This is the goals. What's actually going to take me there? Mm -hmm. Right. And then the Cartesian logical part is let me document what actually what I, what I did clearly so I can go back and look at it in the future. So I get better feedback, better communication between myself over time, really. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been so that has provided so much clarity for me. And it's been so motivational and it's been so good. Like, I think this part of my temperament is that I don't actually remember the emotional tenor of the past very well. Hmm. So like, that's one of the reasons why I was able to get so unhealthy is because I didn't notice it, right? It took me a long time before everyone was like, man, things are, like, you're, you're in the bathroom for a long time, a lot of the time, like what's going on? Like, oh, no, no, no. Um, and like the fatigue, like I had the like, I had episodes where I really understood what was happening, but it was building up already before that, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
And so being able to look at it and say, okay, my HRVs were in the forties in October and they're in the seventies now, like that, <laughs> that means a lot to me, right? My subjective score of how I was doing has gone from the four and a half to seven, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's just an interesting, I wanted to point that out as another anchor that's held me as I've rebuilt myself. Um, and it's it's also interesting because it's like, how are we playing that? One of the things that happened is when I was most fatigued, I didn't really experience play at all, right? Like I was just too tired. Like a, a highly stressed organism doesn't play, mm -hmm. but I needed practice. I needed physical things to keep me working, right? It was like, I wasn't going to get out of the hole by not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't rely on that. Like, I just feel creative and juiced up and excited. And I'm going to do something awesome. Like that wasn't working, right? Yeah. It's just like, I want to be the type of person I've been. So I'm going to try to jump such that I can jump an inch farther, you know, a couple of weeks from now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been, yeah, it's been a really interesting experience to go through and to sort of recognize how we can utilize these tools, right? Like spreadsheets that exist now. This respect for intuition, this respect for, for movement and what the body's telling me, how those can interact and how we can set up a system that supports the place that we want to go. Mm -hmm. I know it's 11.42 now, so. Uh, oh, yeah. They left pause there for the day. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing so much. This has been one of the better ways I could start the day. So, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm curious, uh, for folks who might be new to the practice, uh, any recommended first steps, places they could find you, where they ought to look? Yeah. So if people are looking to find me, um, evolvemoveplay.com is my website. Um, we have a variety of, of online courses and a dedicated kind of uh forum that's off the major social media sites that people can get involved in so that they can have private discussions with other practitioners it's a fast growing community um so i think that's great if people want to get involved in that um, we also have retreats coming up we're going to be starting to like really um push those out coming here soon um and we already have uh like about 50 percent uh sold out for the first two retreats just from returning students so if you're if you're interested, you, know, you kind of want to get in on that as soon as possible. Um, and then as far as, uh, oh, and then Rafe Kelly, just R-A-F-E-K-E-L-E-Y on all the socials, if you want to find my stuff, lots of stuff on YouTube, lots of stuff on Instagram. As far as advice, what I always tell people is go for a walk, right? Every, pretty much anyone can go for a walk. If you go outside, into nature if possible and you walk you're beginning to move and you will feel better unless mm -hmm. you're really sick in which case if you if you can take a walk and not feel better then talk to a professional <laughs> like because that that's that's the point that i got to where i would feel more fatigued from walking for 10 mm -hmm. minutes and i was like yeah, something's really really wrong but 99 percent of the time you go for a walk you'll feel more energized at the end of it and it'll be an opportunity to step into nature um, if you can go for a walk in nature and you can take your shoes off, right, connect to the natural world, put your hand on a tree, pull up on a limb, climb into the tree, take a walk through a rocky stream. This is the thing, this is the basis of it, right? You're just starting to engage with an exploratory connection to locomoting through the environment. Maybe sit down, take a series of deep breaths, calm yourself, let go of the stresses in your life. That I think is the foundation to the practice. And I, I spent a lot of my childhood just walking through the woods. And hmm. for the most part, any time that I've lost motivation, been beat down in my practice over the years, I found if I let go of all of my goals, all of my everything, and just take a walk in the woods, that it will replenish me and begin to open the door to taking more advanced steps. Hmm. So um, if you come and check out our new uh, program return to movement um it's three lectures and uh physical practice for each day of lectures plus two um uh, dedicated uh, movement sessions mm. first practice is walking 
Um, <laughs> so you can find more there. Amazing. Thanks, Riff. Thank you very much, Chandler. And, I'll uh, call you next time. See you next time.